Genesis chapter 13. Last week we started uh, to take a look at some of the great uh, heroes of the faith, starting with Abram, uh, whose name will later become Abraham and his wife Sarai and the promises that God made to them. And we're going to explore a little bit more about Abram's story this morning. And so just to set the stage for you, we're going to talk about Abram and his relationship with his nephew and some crazy stuff that happens. And then we'll conclude with understanding uh, how uh, how this shows us the kind of man that Abram was. Okay, so Genesis chapter 13. When we left Abram last week, he had traveled to Egypt because there was a famine in the land that he had lived. God had made promises to him. He had left his father's country, and the promises that God made to him were rooted in the fact that he was going to bring him to a land that he would give him that he would uh, become a great nation and, and this beautiful promise that God said he would bless those who bless you and curse those that curse you, that God would be for him and against those who are against him. And so we meet Abram again, leaving Egypt in verse one of chapter 13. And the verses will be on the screen as well. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot, with him. Lot is his nephew. Abram and Sarai have no children. Verse 2. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, in gold. And he went on his journey from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abram did what? Called on the name of the Lord. We learned last week that Abram has become a worshiper. He's not just wandering around aimlessly. He's starting to believe that this God, Yahweh, who has called him, can be trusted. And so he's setting up altars in the different places that he goes to demonstrate God's faithfulness and remind him that God is good. Because when he walked by that way, he remembered the place in which he worshiped. So now again, he gets to this altar and he calls on the name of the Lord. Amen. Verse five. Now Lot who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And so there was what? There was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. And so what we learn is that uh, the land that they're living in, it says, could not sustain them. There's so many people and so much livestock between Abram and Lot. God has already begun to bless them that there's starting to be a quarrel between these two men and their uh, servants. And then strife is happening. And we also hear that the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling there, people that would have been in opposition to Abram and his family. And so this is a critical moment as strife is building in the family and quarrels are developing amongst the servants and the sheep are buying at each other and the goats are, or what do the goats do? Just that horrible sound at each other, right? And the horses are neighing and the camels are spitting at each other. It's just terrible. Come on, the camel thing wasn't funny? Okay, guess not. And so the the land, it says it can't contain both of them. And then the Canaanite and the Perizzite are there too. And so they need to be careful that these enemies don't turn on them, especially if they see that they're having strife uh, between each other. Let's go to verse eight now. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. The main thing we're going to see this morning about Abram is that Abram's different. Abram is a, a wonderful, wonderful man. He is a great example of a man of faith. Here we see that Abram is a man of wisdom. He foresees that he and Lot should separate for peace. He's also a peacemaker. He doesn't want strife, and so he's thinking ahead, and he's a man of trust. Because what he says is, he doesn't say, well, I'm going to get the best land, and you can get what's left over, even though Abram is the head of the household. He doesn't fight for the best land. He's trusting, ultimately, in God, because he believes that God will take care of him, whether he's in a time of famine or a time of abundance. 
Abram is a great man. We see that here. And so he offers Lot the chance to pick which land he wants to dwell in. That takes us to verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw. Let me hear you read that uh, section with me. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw. That's an important phrase in the text. He lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan. The Jordan is a river. That it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And this land was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. And so Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separ- thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against who? Against the Lord. And so we see here is Abram gives Lot the chance to choose where he wants. And what we see is that it seems like Lot makes the choice to pick the best land. Remember, they've just left Egypt because of a famine probably caused by a drought. You go to Egypt because the Nile River feeds the land and feeds the earth. So even when there's a drought, they can still grow crops because of the water. And so Lot, it says, Look, lifted up his eyes and saw. And, and the Hebrew there is, is describing someone that's taking the time to take a good look. And as he takes his time to take a good look, he sees the Jordan River and the Jordan River, River Valley full of soil and moisture. And it's just the perfect place to grow your crops and graze your livestock. It says it was well watered. And so Lot looks at what he can see, and he makes a decision based on what he see, on what he sees. But here's the thing. While the land was well watered, it was also saturated with evil. The New Living Translation of verse 13 uh, says this. It says, but the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Uh, The way we would say it in these parts is they were wicked, wicked. (laughs) And so even though he's going to a place that is well watered, it's saturated with evil. But Abram gave Lot the chance to choose. Well, we'll see how that goes later. Let's see uh, what happens to Abram as he goes now to the land of Canaan. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him. Now lift up your eyes and look. Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants. How long? I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that If anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and its breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there, what did he do? He built an altar to the Lord. We see this pattern of this man of faith that God speaks to him. So even though uh, he goes to Canaan, the, the drier land, when he gets there, God speaks to him again. So Lot has well-watered land and, and cities and, and, and people around him. And Abram goes out into the desert as a nomad, as an exile, as a, as a stranger in a foreign land. But when he gets there, God expands the promise that he made. In chapter 12, we read that uh, God said, Abram, go to a land I will show you. And now he says, I want you to look up and see everything that you see. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you. Verse 14, uh, we read that God said, lift up your eyes and look, which is what Lot did. You remember that? I had you read that section. Lot, when choosing the land, he lifted his eyes to look. And now God says to Abram, I want you to lift up your eyes and look at what I am going to provide for you, what I'm going to give you. Lot looked up and he saw what is good. And Abram is told by God to look at things that he couldn't even see, which were wonderful. 
And so then we read at the end of this chapter that Abram builds another altar. And, and when you see him build an altar, he's worshiping God. He's, he's praying to God. He's seeking God. So he builds an altar in Canaan, which is not a, a good land, but he has God in relationship with him. Does Abram have the best of the best? No, but the Lord is with him. He doesn't have the best of the best, but God is with him. Say amen if Abram got the better of the deal here. Amen, right? And more than the best land and the best crops and the best watering hole, Abram wants to be where God is leading him. That's what he wants. That is what is influencing his decision. That is what is affecting his life. And that's what makes Abram different. He can let Lot have his first choice of the land because he says, you know what? God's going to take care of me. If you've ever played a pickup basketball game, right? The one with the first pick, that's a good thing because you get to pick your best player first, right? For those of you uh, that are going to play basketball out uh, at this new hoop that has been set up, I just want to let you know, if you're a captain and you have the first pick, don't pick me. <laughs> don't pick me. Lot gets first pick, but Abram's not worried because he knows God is going to take care of him. And no matter what happens, that, that's what it means to be a person of faith. They, the best things may not be happening, but if you have God working, if you have God leading, what greater treasure is that? And so that's the life we see from Abram. He's different. He wants what God wants, not just what he sees and, and what he can experience. And that brings us now to an interesting story in Genesis chapter 14. You know, a lot of people, they wonder what Ab Abram and Abraham looked like. I have a picture of what Abraham looked like. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> This is, uh, this is one of the most famous paintings of Abram or Abraham. This is him right here. Could you guess, right? right? What do you see on him? Long beard. Right Here's another. This is from the Wikipedia article on Abraham, right? You see an older man with a beard. Here's another picture. I love this one. This is from the Experiencing God book. Isn't that beautiful? Just his eyes looking towards heaven. And here's, here's another one. Uh, later in the story, Abram. We see this picture of uh, Abram and Abraham pictured as an old man with a white beard, but I, I don't know if that's really the best description. This might be a little bit better. Um, <laughs> if that's too risque for church, I'll, I'll give you this one. We're about to read a story in chapter 14 about Abram being a victorious warrior. Now, we think of Abram as like this old dude who can't have kids who's like living in a tent. But maybe this is a better picture of, of Abraham, actually. I mean, or Santa, man, like buff Santa getting ready. That, that we'll do that at the men's weekend, that picture right there. I want you to think of Abram a little bit differently as we read this story. Now, uh, we're going to get to chapter 14. And, and uh, this is the part in the Bible where you're going to be tempted to tune out and check your phone. Or tune out and think about whether or not you, you, you know, you're going to have enough time to get the groceries and all those different things later. Fight that. We're going to read a bunch of names and a bunch of places. But I'm going to check throughout this chapter that you're still with me. And don't, don't fail me now. If I, if, I say, if I say, because he went where, you better say it, or, or this, I'm just going to be so discouraged. Come on. This is, this is the Bible here. This is important. We're about to read the story of really the first world war. And, and uh, one quick Bible tip before I start in verse 1. I don't think Jacob's going to share this in his class. But when you're reading the Bible and there are a lot of names and places that you don't understand, understand or don't know how to say, if you say it confidently, even if you mispronounce it, nobody knows that you're wrong. You want to sound like a Bible scholar? Just say it what you think it sounds like, but say it with confidence, and we'll all believe you. Here we go. Ready? Verse 1. Are you ready? ready. Are you ready? Yes. ready? And it came about in the days of Amphrio, king of Shinar, 
Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedralamer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of Goim, and they made... Oh, my gosh. Someone even said it loud, but they said it in a pathetic tone. War. <laughs> All those people in verse 1, they made what? War. War with Bera, the king of Sodom, and with Beersha, the king of Gomorrah, Sinab, the king of Adma, and uh, Shemember, the, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All these came as allies in the valley of Sidim, that is the what? Salt the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedralamer, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. Let me explain to you what's going on. There are five kings that have been servants to one king, King Kedralamer, and his allies, three other kings. So you've got five kings that have been serving four kings, and these five kings, after the twelfth year, they're done. And so they're coming together saying, I don't want to serve him anymore. What kind of name is Kedralamer anyway? And they are going to join together and they're going to fight against Kedralamer and his allies. That's what we're reading. Okay, everybody good so far? Okay. Someone's phone just dinged. You're tuning out. Verse 5. In the 14th year of Kedralamer and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Rephaim and Asheroth Kiranim and Zuzim and, ha and Ham and uh, Ham. I messed up Ham. And Ham and <laughs> Emim and Shavel Kiraithim and the Horites and in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the what? The wilderness. the wilderness. And they turned back and they came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazan Tamar. And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zorm, they came out and they arrayed for what? Battle, Battle against them in the valley of Sidim. And they came against Kedralamer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of Goim, and uh, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of uh, Elisar. Four kings against how many? Five. Five. You guys are doing great. We're almost done. Now, the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits. Let me hear you say tar pits. Tar pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the, kill, to the hill country. And then they took all of the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply, and they departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions, and departed, for he was living where? He was living in Sodom. Great job. Give yourselves a round of applause. So... Five kings aren't happy to be ruled by another king, Kedralamer. They join together and they start to fight him. Kedralamer and his allies, four kings, they come and they, they start to rout these five kings. And so the king, especially uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they start running. And when they start running, they fall into tar pits. It's just a sticky, ooey mess. Just think of your children playing with slime on your couch. Same sort of thing. They get stuck in the tar pits. Their army, their generals, their, their battle gear, the kings, they get stuck in the tar pits. And so Kedralamer and his allies, what they do is they go to the city of Sodom and they go to the city of Gomorrah and they pillage everything. They, they take everything. They take all the people. They take all the goods. They take all of the, the resources and the riches. And they totally plunder the cities of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. And it says that they even took the people, including Lot, Abram's nephew. Interesting. Lot, when he made his choice of where to live. He lived in the land that appeared to be abundant and prosperous near the region of Sodom and Gomorrah. But you know what? Even though they had a bunch of abundance, this war came and all of their stuff was gone. It didn't do him much good that he was in the place that seemed and looked to be better if, a, if an army comes and takes all your stuff, right? And also the texts tell us that at this point in the story, in the journey, Lot is no longer living near Sodom. The last verse said that he was living in Sodom. Hmm. This war is massive. It's 
big. This map may not mean much to you, but this is the whole region of Canaan. And all of these lines describe all of the places that the armies went. And my point in showing you that is this was a massive conflict. Hundreds of miles were traveled and battles fought. This was a big deal with mighty armies we read about under the direction of these kings. What does this have to do with our story? Well, it has to do with our story that Lot, Abram's nephew, is now a captive being led away by this king. And so let's see how Abram responds in verse 13. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Anir, and these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and what did he do? He defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. This is old man with the white beard Abram, with his other servants and his other allies going against the kings that defeated five other kings in battle. Old man can't have kids, Abram. Maybe looks more like that dude than we thought. I mean, this is unbelievable. With a, with a few of his servants, he goes back and it says that in verse 16, he brought back what? All the goods. He brought back all the goods and also brought, brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. He brought back all the goods. He brought back Lot and all his possessions. He brought back the woman. Say amen. And the people, the women and the people. I love that. The Bible is awesome. All the goods, Lot and his possessions, the women and the people. Hallelujah. Nobody has that as their memory verse or, you know, their, their life verse. Maybe we should dig into that. This is unbelievable. This is old man Abram. When he hears by someone that escaped the slaughter that Lot is missing, he's awakened to become a warrior. Yes, he's a wanderer. Yes, he's a worshiper. But it seems like, oh, normally he just keeps himself. No, no, his, his family member has been taken captive. And so he pulls together the men that he has and he goes and he gets Lot back and the goods and the women and the people. Abram's response when he hears that his nephew Lot has been taken captive is wonderful. He doesn't... He doesn't Show bitterness in his heart. I'm sorry, what happened? Lot got taken. Well, last I heard, he was living in Sodom, so he got what was coming to him. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, oh, my nephew Lot has been taken. Oh, by whom? Oh, Kedralamer, the great king? What am I going to do? Throw a sheep at him? <laughs> He's not afraid. He's also not detached. He doesn't go, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm living for Yahweh, building altars. That's their problem. No, he, he knows that he must get involved and he, he saves Lot. He goes and pursues and fights against the four king alliance that had just won this world war and he wins. What is he doing? Here, here's what he's doing. Abram is leveraging the blessing and favor upon his life on Lot's life. He is leveraging his blessing and favor for the good of the rest of his family. God had said, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I will be for those who are for you and I will be against those who are against you. And he believes God's promise. And so he's willing to go face four kings to get his nephew back because he knows that the blessing and favor of God is surrounding him. And he's going to let some of that splash into Lot's life in spite of Lot's decision making. 
In spite of Lot's foolishness, Abram says, I am going to take the blessing of God on my life and go use it to bring victory and bring Lot back to safety. I love that. He, he's so different. He's not keeping score and mad at Lot. He, he says, I can do this because God is with me and I'm going to go. And so what happens next is remarkable. A, a short passage of scripture, verse 17 through 20, which has so much in it. We're not going to dive in too deep, but let's just read what happens. Verse 17, then after his return from the defeat of Kedralamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Sheva. That is the king's valley. One of the people that is out there, too, is someone named Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem. Just so you know, later on, we're going to discover that Salem is where Jerusalem is. And so this figure, Melchizedek, is the king of Jerusalem, and he brings out bread and wine. And not only is he a king, it says that he, would, uh, he was also a what? He was the priest of the Most High God. Abram goes to battle, and when these kings are coming back to him, one of the kings is the king of Jerusalem, who's a king and a priest of the Most High God, and he brings out bread and wine and says this, verse 19, Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and Abram gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of all. He, he tithes. This, what is going on here? I mean, so much is happening in this story. But Abram, who trusts God, goes out into this battle. And God blesses him for his courage and his trust in God. And says, you are blessed of God Most High, who is the possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 21. And then the king of Sodom comes and says to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their share. So in the conclusion of this peculiar story, the king of Sodom, who literally has just had his behind saved by Abram. And remember, Abram brought back all of the goods. He brought back Lot and all of his possessions. And he brought back the women and the people. The king of Sodom comes to him indebted. His whole, his whole kingdom is indebted to Abram. The king of Sodom got his butt whooped. He, he lost. He's indebted to Abram. And he says to Abram, you can keep this stuff. Can we have the people? And Abram says, I'm going to give you everything back. I don't want any of your stuff. I don't want any of your people. I don't want any of it at all. Because I have sworn to the Most High God that He is my provider, and I don't even want a hint of a word spoken out in the land that you have made me rich. All I want are some sandwiches for the boys that did all the fighting. The king says, let me have the people back. You can keep the goods as your reward. Abram says, no, I'm not here for the reward. My God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And what we see in this man, Abram, throughout this story is that he refuses to get entangled with the kings and the things of this world. He has separated himself for who? For God. Abram has just won World War I and he walks back to a tent. Abram has saved tons of people, livestock, goods, and all he wants is, is something for his soldiers to eat, and that's it. Something is different about Abram. Now, I know this story may be new to you. You may not have ever heard this story in your life. But I hope you see in this story that something's different about Abram. 
He lets Lot choose where he wants to live. He's content with living far away from where the river is. He's trusting God with his future and with his life. He, 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 he trusts God enough to go into a battle, a, a Bedouin shepherd to go in and fight against four mighty kings. And then when he's pro uh, proposed with an opportunity to get all of the reward and have a name made for himself by all of these kings bowing down in homage to him, he says, I don't want anything. I've got God. Something's different about Abram. Something's different about Abram. He's, he's strange. He lets other people have the first pick. He keeps to himself, but yet is aware of what's going on around him. He's a worshiper. He's a warrior, and he's determined not to be just like everyone else. He is living by a different script than all of the other actors around him. And the text, tell us, the text tells us here that he says, I have sworn to the Lord God most high possessor of heaven and earth. The Hebrew here uh, for, for swarm means that he, he put his hand up in an oath. He stands before these kings and he says, I am swearing allegiance to God most high. I don't need your stuff. He's the possessor of heaven and earth. Something's different about Abram. I'd like you to go to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 11. In the New Testament, towards the back, Hebrews, there are uh, some of the most powerful verses in Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the story of the great men and women of old and their faith. And uh, I should not go to this passage until we get to another story in Abram's life. This is a, an obscure, maybe, dare I say, boring story about Abram. We're going to read that he almost kills his son. We're going to read that he trusts God and God gives him a child in his old age. We're going to read about some amazing, miraculous stories about Abram, not the world war where he doesn't take the stuff. But church, what we see in this obscure story is we see Abram is a man of faith. We see that Abram has sworn his allegiance to God and he's not entangled in the things of this earth. And Hebrews 11 tells us about Abram in verse one. It says this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not what? Not seen. For by it, by faith, the men of old gained approval. God looked down at the, the men and women of faith from the past when they lived by faith and they were different and said, those are my people. Verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he, God, is a what? He's a what? He's a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For the person that comes to God must believe that God is, he exists. And you've got to believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Abram, throughout this story, is not concerned about what he can get in this life. Throughout this whole story, he's not concerned about getting a reward by what he can lift up his eyes and see. His reward wasn't coming from him living in the best place. His reward was not being noticed by other people. It, his reward was not from the good things that happened or the victories that he had seen. His reward was coming from his God. Verse 8. By faith, Abram, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a what? He lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was what? Come on, say looking. He was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He's living in a tent. He's moving from place to place. Abram is different. 
And what is different about him? When it's time for him to lift up his eyes and see, his eyes are fixed on what God is going to bring to him. His eyes are fixed on the promises of God. He's not looking at the land around him. He's not looking at the kings around him or the reward that he can see. His eyes are on the reward that is coming in the future. And everything he does, everything he does shows that he's not living for right now. Everything he does, it's as if he's like an alien in a strange place. He's different. He's not doing what everyone else expects him to do. I'm the oldest in the family. Guess who gets to pick where they live first? Not Abram. God already picked where he was going to live. Lot can have whatever he wants. I don't need any reward for my victories and my battle. I already have my reward. I'm not looking out at the land. I'm not looking out at the people. I'm looking at God. Abram believed that God was going to reward him. And he lived his whole life because of that. Verse 13, all of these died in faith without receiving the promise, but having seen them, oh, having seen them they ha and, and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things, they make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they came out, then they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a what? They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And therefore, listen to this beautiful verse. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for him. Amen. This is the confession that every generation of the people of faith make. And it is the confession that we, as the current generation of the people of faith, must make. We have to raise our hand and say, God, the possessor of heaven and earth, is the one I'm living for. My reward is not from the things that I have here and now. My reward is rooted in his promise and God's promise to you is better than anything you could find as a reward in this life. But you're not going to believe that unless you can have faith that God is and come to know that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And if you believe that, you and I, like Abram, will be different. Too many people who claim the name of Jesus right now and raise their hand in song, and, and sing the praises of God, and, and, and confess Jesus as Lord, are not different than anyone else around them. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. There's a disconnect between what the Bible says the people of faith should be like, and what it seems like we too often are. Church, we have something better than the things that are calling to us now to invest our lives in. Abram was different in every moment of his life, in every situation. His eyes weren't on here and now. His eyes were on God. And he was willing to, to say no. He was willing to make decisions based on the reward to come. And, and that's what I want. And that's what you and I need to, to strive for in this life, not to be like everyone else, but to live by faith because we trust God's promise. So the very last verse for us to read after this wild story is the very next verse in Genesis, which says this. The very next verse after all that we read about Abram says this. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. After all these things, the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Let's pray. Lord, most high possessor of heaven and earth, blessed be your name. Thank you for your promises, which are better than life. God, I ask for your help 
today to be people of faith who believe that you are, who believe that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you, God. And I know that I'm in a room right now with people that are trying our best to seek you. Help us to see, Lord, that the reward of finding you and the promises to come are worth it and better. Help us to live by faith and not by sight. Help us to be different because we're trusting in you. Be our shield. Be our reward. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.